Halt and Catch Fire. It's sort of like the Breakfast Club had a baby with real genius. And then that baby was raped by Gone Girl. The first season of Halt and Catch Fire is about building a computer. We have Joe McMillan, the enigmatic, domineering visionary in the mold of Steve Jobs. Gordon Clark, the meek engineering genius, who is an obvious send-up of Steve Wozniak. And finally we have Cameron Howe, the anarchistic programmer prodigy. The setting is Cardiff Electric, a mainframe software company in the Silicon Prairie, specifically Dallas. Throughout the show, Joe's basic job is to set the targets that they need the machine to hit in order for it to sell, and Gordon builds the machine that hits those targets. And Cameron does everything in her power to destroy Joe. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm, I, I mean, she, she builds the BIOS, the basic input-output system for the computer. I don't do spoiler warnings, but I will tell you this. I am going to pound on this show season by season, episode by episode, till it bursts at the seams. I am going to ruin this show for you. Therefore, if you continue to watch this review after I have said that, it is on you. So let's begin. This is your opening hook. Some incredibly painfully heavy symbolism followed by a lazy stereotype. A sociopathic power broker in a smart suit. It's not like we've seen that a million times before. Maybe for a bit of character depth, you can have this Joe McMillan raping Thai prostitutes as he fondles bags of money. You know what? Forget it. Forget it. This show is not worth your time. This review is over. Um, good night, good luck, goodbye. Honey Badger lifts the face of the puppet master, chews it up like a honey master, spits it on a tea copy pasta. The honey master. I'm just kidding, folks. But to be fair, I did actually check out at this point in the show, the first time I watched it. Thankfully, it wasn't me who queued the show up at Netflix. Uh, it was my husband, who is a far more forgiving and patient person than myself, and he continued to watch it after I walked off. And I just saw the show in little snippets as I was walking past the living room, and he, and he was watching it. And at one point, I remember seeing Joe McMillan screwing Cameron Howe, and I turned to my husband and I said, why are they having sex? And he looked at me and he said, I have no idea. And I was like, well, enjoy your show. <laughs> and I continued on my way, smugly secure in my knowledge that my husband was wasting his time. You know, frankly, I don't know why he tolerates me, but that's beside the point. I didn't actually get into the story until Joe started to talk to Gordon and try to pull that spark of genius, pull it out of the apathy and depression that Gordon was just basting in. A16. What is this? Page 33. I'm not in the mood. All right, why don't you go blow dry your hair some more or something? Don't you realize what you wrote? If you see him around, I want to meet that guy. There's a project I want to discuss with him. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? This puts the future squarely in the hands of those who know computers not for what they are, but for everything they have the potential to be. What? You know who said that? No, no, I don't. You did. This right here was what made me give Halt and Catch Fire a second chance. But as this is a review, I probably should start at the beginning. So by the time I rewatched the beginning, I had actually watched a significant portion of the first season of Halt and Catch Fire. When I came back to it, since I'd seen a lot more of Joe, the one-note, one-dimensional portrayal 
that they put at the beginning struck me as just bizarre. Uh, and at the time, I was just like, oh god, well this is obviously first installment weirdness. When a creator just doesn't know what they're going to do with the character. So the character can act in weird ways that they really isn't really consistent with their characterization later on in, in the work. And I figured that's what they did. But before we conclude that that's why they put that in, let's see a little bit more of the intro. Oh, uh, this doesn't mean you get the job. You mean we're not in love? Here. Right here. Incidentally, I still don't know why they had sex, but whatever. Joe's not sociopathic. The emotion he's displaying here is regret and shame. Sociopaths or people with antisocial personality disorder don't feel those emotions or they feel them very faintly. Joe's not feeling these emotions faintly. This is what undermines the initial send-up of Joe's character, that initial first scene where they're trying to hook us into the show. So why do this? Why go to all the trouble of creating a painfully cheesy, over-the-top opening scene that sets a character up to be one thing and then completely undermine what you've set up just three scenes later? Count how many people in white pass the basketball in this clip. The correct answer is 15. But did you see the gorilla? By opening the story with that scene, the creators are telling you to pay attention to the basketball. Meanwhile, they're running a veritable stampede of invisible gorillas through the set of Halt and Catch Fire. It took me a while to decode this initial opening scene. The first time I watched it, I thought Joe was being deliberately insulting to Cameron. It took a friend of mine, Brian, to point out that the scene actually came across as Joe teasing Cameron, just making a joke. So I rewatched it again, and I realized Brian was right. Joe's sense of humor throughout the entire first season is very dry and very deadpan. It's often hard to tell if he's joking at all, and his jokes also play on the absurdity of the situation. Like this. This doesn't mean you get the job. This is an invitation by Joe to Cameron to relate on a personal level, not as power broker and prodigy. Joe's saying, let's put aside the play for dominance and have a laugh about the absurdity of the situation we found ourselves in. Of course, Cameron doesn't take it that way. Admittedly, her back was turned, <clears throat> but you'd think when she turned around and saw the shocked expression on his face, she would have realized that he didn't intend it to be hurtful. Instead, Cameron says, I see your knife, and I raise you a bazooka, bitch! You mean we're not in love? <laughs> Looking back, I realized why I thought he was being deliberately insulting. It's because of her reaction. Because she had reacted as if he had insulted her, obviously he must have intended to insult her. You can hide a lot in that little sleight of hand. I call it the agency sink. But I wasn't completely taken in because I still saw the gorilla exit stage left. <laughs> in this review series, I'm going to be pointing out all the gorillas walking across Halt and Set Fire set. And in the process, you're going to see how the furniture in this show keeps ending up in very strange places. Of course, I could be wrong. Instead of a work of subtle genius, the creative team behind the show actually wrote something with all the nuanced characterization of a very, very bad Saturday morning cartoon. Like most things in life, the interpretation is up to you. Do you have any idea how expensive this thing was? 
Let's turn this thing inside out. Okay, so the first step to getting Cardiff Electric to build Joe and Gordon's computer is to reverse engineer the IBM BIOS, which is what's happening here. And it's actually quite a bit of fun. You get to see Joe and Gordon just be human and engage in a lot of writing of hex code, which is, it, it's a montage. It's the 80s, you know, whatever. Let's do it. What am I doing here? Uh, we're writing down the contents of the addresses. How many of these addresses do we need to transcribe? 65,536. Fire up the monitor. There's a prompt. That's a good sign. You found a needle in a haystack. Hold on. Let's fire up the printer. Okay. All right. Well, so they reverse engineer the IBM BIOS, and uh, Joe, as he promises Gordon earlier in the show, Bosworth and Cardiff would never go for something. So like we that. forced their hand. Forced their hand. How are you going to force their hand? Let me worry about that part. Initiates a series of manipulative and strategic gymnastics to force Cardiff into the PC business that have to be seen to be believed. And if you want to see them, watch it. There has to be some mystery here. At some point, we pick up Cameron as the last ditch choice to program the BIOS for the new PC that Cardiff is forced to be it's forced by Joe to build. And then we have the ending sequence where a whole rugby team worth of IBM lawyers walk into the offices of Cardiff. Holy shit. trying to prove with all this right here here's another invisible gorilla a lot of reviewers said they felt the second episode dropped the ball I disagree at this point if you're paying attention to the invisible gorilla doing cartwheels in front of you you know that things aren't gonna go as expected look at Joe's face That isn't the face of a sociopathic power broker who's got everyone dancing to his tune. It's the face of a man terrified because he's out of his depth. All of this, it's going to go sideways on Joe. Big time. Oh, and also this split second thing that they flashed up, it's really cute. They've included the most common file date, and it's the most common because it's the lazy option. Essentially, January the 1st, 1980 is what happens when you click return three times on the input fields for the date. But here's my question. Why change the standard format to include the actual name of the day that January 1st, 1980 occurs on? But, you know, Tuesday is a very interesting day, particularly a Tuesday in January. So this is a review series that I am starting in which I explore interesting media. Specifically, I'd like to focus on media that passes what I'm calling the fire test, and I'm calling it in honor of Halt and, Ca halt and Catch Fire because Halt and Catch Fire passes it every single episode. And somebody suggested I call it the Teeman test because I created it, and it's sort of a quasi-reverse Bechdel test although I think it measures something a little bit more profound than the Bechdel test. And it's intended to judge a work based on how it treats male characters and whether or not it's creating uh, what I would consider a strong male character. And how the fire test goes is this. Does a male character in the show show a reaction, an emotional reaction to the actions of the people around him that does not relate to protecting, providing, or avenging women and has a significant impact on the plot, characterization, or setting of a work. So go and find any work that you think actually 
actually fulfills those three criteria, and I will be happy to review it. And I'll probably also be reviewing Complete Crap that you guys send me as well, because you guys seem to love it when I get annoyed. So, do it. Send me these works. If they pass the, the fire test, great. I would love to take a look at what you think passes the fire test. And if it just is sheer mind-numbing bullshit, I will look at it too, and I will react to it. And I will try to analyze it as much as it can be analyzed. So send those recommendations to honeybadgersradio at gmail.com and I will get right on them after I finish this review series of Holt and Catch Fire. Yay! You did a solid job explaining the software, but I need you to do me one favor. Okay. Next time I move to close, this is what you do. Okay, what? You shut up! Joe is quite the sales diva. If he had 80s power hair, I think he'd be flicking it right about now. What a showboat. <laughs> don't, 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 don't troll. Don't make it worse. Don't make it worse. All right.